Okay, let's begin. So this week we are beginning to talk about the play Woman in the Window by Alma de Groen. Uh, let's look at our discussion questions. Question one. The first setting of the play is in Leningrad, 1951. What do you think the society is like then and there? And how can you tell? So what evidence do you have? Question two. How might you describe the second setting of the play? Why or why would you describe it like this? What evidence do you have? And why do you think the play uses this kind of setting? What is the purpose? Three, the play has two settings with rapid scene changes between them. And each supporting actor plays one role in each setting. Uh, so each supporting actor plays two roles, one in each setting. How might you present this on stage? How would you make it work in a real performance? Four, why do you think Stalin does not just have Anna killed on page 19? Why does he want her alive? And five, Kors says that poetry must be useful and pay its way like everything else. Do you agree? Why or why not? So let's distribute the questions. Question one will go to group five. Question two will go to group one. Question three will go to group two. Question four will go to group three. And question five will go to group four. Uh, I'll give you 10 minutes to discuss your question.
OK, let's see what you guys think. Question one, group five, how would you describe the first setting of Leningrad in 1951? What kind of world is this? OK, group five would like us to pay attention to scene one. At the very beginning, Leningrad 1951, this is Russia right after the Second World War. Uh, and so as group five notes at this point, Russia is very closed off from the rest of the world. And at the bottom of this page, I think it's page one, uh, Lily mentions our great leader. So it seems like this society is controlled by one person. On the next page, page two, Akhmatova says, or sorry, Lily says, he's not omnipotent, which means there are some things that he cannot do. He doesn't own the stars. But if Lily has to mention the stars, that means that their leader pretty much owns everything else. So it's like the whole society belongs to this one person. And in this situation, at the end of scene one, uh, Akhmatova says, they want us to die while we're still alive. And group five says, this means that uh, the great leader wants everyone to obey him, that they can't have their own thoughts or their own decisions. Um, we can also notice some other evidence. For example, on page two, the first long paragraph. At the end of line one, Lily mentions the secret police. What kind of society would need a secret police? Right, a very controlled kind of society. Uh, and then in the next long paragraph, Akhmatova uh, compares their society. If you look at the end of line three, one imagines the guards opening the doors of that cattle truck when it reached Siberia and finding their prisoners entombed in a wall of ice. So they, if they are prisoners, they don't just lock them in jail, they take them all the way to Siberia. So it's also a very harsh society. It looks like um, it doesn't just want to make criminals better, it wants to punish criminals. So, we start to get a sense of that kind of society. And if you know your history, this is in the uh, Soviet Union, USSR, Sudan, in the early days when Stalin was a totalitarian dictator, Du Tsai. Um, and basically, whatever he said was the law. And any slight sign of disagreement or disobedience was illegal. And you have the secret police, and the secret police would also recruit ordinary people to spy on each other 
to make sure that everybody is following uh, whatever Stalin wants them to do. Uh, these people are called informants, nation. So that's the kind of society that uh, Akhmatova and her friends live in. Questions or other ideas? OK, so we talked about the society of the past. What about the society in the plays Future, group one, how would you describe this science fictional society? OK, so group one uh, focuses on scene two. This is the first time that we see this future society. Um, and they compare this future society with the society in the past. If in the past everyone has to follow what Stalin says, in this future setting, uh, people also still have to follow orders. But it seems like it's even more controlled than the past society. In the past, uh, the first scene is Lily and uh, Anna complaining about their society. But in scene two, Rachel, when she's even a little bit uh, outside of where she is supposed to be, this strange voice talks to her from a public address system, Guangbo Xitong and like tries to find out who she is, why is she there, what is she supposed to be doing? So it seems like in this far future society, there's even more control. Everything you do uh, has to be following the rules. And it's even worse than in the past because in the first setting, there's only one guy, right, Stalin. He can order everybody around, but he himself cannot personally control everything. He has to work through other people. But in this future society, it looks like uh, maybe it's controlled by machines or robots. And of course, machines and robots don't think about their orders. They just carry out whatever orders that they are given. So it's even less possible to disagree. Um, we can notice at the bottom of page two, when the voice tells Rachel to stay where you are, her first reaction is to panic. 
Uh, and this tells us that she knows that there could be very bad consequences um, for doing something wrong. If you know that you can maybe talk to somebody or negotiate with somebody, you probably would not panic. You would start thinking of a plan. But Rachel knows that there's very few things that she can do, so she panics. And in her immediate response is, what have I done? I haven't done anything wrong. And the voice says, resistance will be a further violation. So it looks like this kind of uh, law and order doesn't care about the person's intentions or thinking. They only care about the person's actions. And then Rachel tries to explain her situation. She says, my tracer went random. I'm trying to go home. So if this is true, then she has done nothing wrong. But she's still so afraid of this voice. And that tells us what kind of society this is. Even an innocent mistake can have very um, serious consequences. Um, group one mentioned Big Brother. If you've read the novel 1984, uh, Big Brother is the leader of that government, and the government uses two-way TVs uh, and also secret police to keep an eye on everybody all the time. OK, thank you. Uh, do you have other ideas or questions about this one? OK, let's move on to question three. So we've talked about these two settings, but they both take place on the same stage in the same play and often even using the same actors. So how would you do this? How would you create this kind of performance group two? So I think that it's, it's pretty hard because it's a performance on a stage and on a spot. So for the settings, and for the settings must be different because on the same stage, if the settings are the same and the audience may become get confused. So we figure out some ways and they might work. <laughs> First, maybe there will be two groups of actors to play the same role. They will be the first one. One is for the future and one for the past. And then number two, maybe we can use the projector to project the different slides to make people feel the different the path to feel the time it has already changed. And the diff number three is maybe they can have the different lighting design. Maybe the light will change, the people can feel that the light change, that means that they are in different different time zone or different in the Australia or in the, in the Russian. And the number four, maybe the different music can be played so between the two different things or settings to have the people understand the time setting is varied and uh, number five level could be more easily let to have a narrator just tell people now we are in what page what age we are in now so i think it was the easiest way to have people know thank you Thank you. Wow, this group has many ideas. Excellent. Um, so let's talk about some of these ideas. They mentioned that maybe you would have two groups of actors to make sure that every role has someone to play that role. Um, that could be one choice. But we should note that when the author was writing this play, she was careful to make sure that uh, for the role divisions, it is possible to use only the minimum number of actors. She designed the play so that uh, one actor playing two roles, those two roles would not appear immediately one after the other, because that would be impossible. Um, so if you wanted to, you could, with a little bit of uh, hurry, uh, you could make the original minimal actor uh, distribution that could work if you wanted to. Um, and there's also, 
if you use one actor for two roles, you get an interesting effect. The audience knows it's the same actor. And so the audience will start to think, is there a connection between these two roles? Is there something, uh, some kind of meaning uh, in this division? The author says no, but uh, maybe there is some kind of connection anyway. Could be quite interesting. Uh, and next, group two talks about the design of the stage. They mentioned that we could use a projector, Toyingji. And I think you mean a projector behind the stage, right? And so, like, there would be like a uh, a screen, and you would project different backgrounds depending on the setting. Uh, if you put a projector in front of the stage, it has to be very high so that the actors don't walk in front of the light. Um, both are possible, and uh, some plays have used this method successfully, so it does work. Um, but the disadvantage of this strategy is that projected backgrounds look pretty fake. If your play performance is a realist performance, then using a projection would make it feel less real. Um, so if you wanted to use um, physical stage design, maybe you could have like flying stage parts. So like in this scene, some uh, objects would fly down and other objects would fly up. And in the next scene, they would switch. Maybe you would divide the stage into two halves. And so while the action is happening here, uh, the other half can be prepared for the next scene, something like that. Or you can uh, forget realism. You don't have to make it look real. You can have an empty stage with only actors. Uh, and the audience would imagine whatever the actors are talking about. That could also work. Now, if we go even further and uh, like look at a non-traditional stage, if maybe the stage is not one way, but it's a circle, and the audience is sitting around the stage, this is called in the round. Uh, then you can have like one half of the stage is this setting, one half of the stage is that setting, and it could slowly rotate. It's also another way to do this. There are many, many different ways. Um, as long as you can make sure that your audience is not confused about where the setting is for each scene, that's fine. So some ways to differentiate between the two settings. As group two mentions, you can use different lighting. Uh, usually we mean different colors of lighting. Um, if like if you use the same color and you shine on different places, it might not be different enough. So for example, in the past, you might use a more kind of yellow orange lighting. In the future, you might use a kind of blue gray lighting to give a different feeling for each setting. Group two mentioned music. Uh, you could use music, but the disadvantage of using music is that it can be a bit distracting. After all, the point of a play is the actors speaking the lines. So this is a bit unlike movies. When you watch a movie and it has music, Often the director will make sure at every second or every frame, like 24th, uh, 20, 124th of a second, each moment that the dialogue is louder than the music. So it's a very uh, tight control of the volume. But when you put on a live play, you can't have that kind of control. Maybe an actor will say this line louder, that line softer. Maybe an actor will decide to give a different performance uh, in the afternoon and in the evening. So using music all the time could be a bit hard. But there is one way that you can use music uh, pretty safely, which is during the scene transitions, when you move from one scene to the next scene. You can use uh, one kind of music to tell the audience that we are entering the past and another kind of music to tell the audience that we are entering the future. That could work. Uh, and so that is closely related to 
group two's last idea, which is to use a narrator. Uh, their idea is when transitioning between scenes, somebody will say like uh, Leningrad 1951 or Australia, the far future. Um, again, that is very clear, but it could also be distracting because in this play, there is no character named narrator. Some plays do have a narrator. Um, and so this is uh, something that you would add to the play and you would therefore change the meaning of the play. If you add a narrator, people will start to, uh, it will feel more like a, a story and less like a performance. It, like the, if there's somebody there reading to you the settings and the framework, it feels less real. So you would have to know that this is the kind of performance you would get. This is the kind of experience that your audience would have. So all of these options are possible, but we should remember that every choice you make, every option you choose, uh, changes how the play feels for the audience. Each choice creates a different play. Thank you. Um, other groups, do you have ideas or questions? Okay, I think we can, we have time to do the next question. Question four, group three, why doesn't Stalin just kill Anna Akhmatova? Why does he need to keep her alive? So why doesn't Stalin just kill Anna? Group uh, three has a two part answer. The first part is on page 19. Near the bottom. Um, the last thing that Stetsky says. Comrade Stalin believes writers are engineers of human souls. We need a, our greatest writers to describe what we're doing. Um, and previously, we already have discovered that Anna is a great writer on pages 13 to 14, scene 10. Uh, let's look at page 14. Uh, the second time Kors talks. 
spanned for 30 years, and every soldier in the trenches knew her words by heart. So we know that she is a very powerful writer. And in fact, uh, after the middle of this page, uh, Kors says they call her the Empress of Russia. So she's such a good writer that she has some kind of power in Russia. So this is someone that Stalin could be very useful for Stalin if he could get her to change her mind. And this is the second part of uh, group three's answer, which is she disagrees with Stalin, but they don't have enough proof. She privately disagrees, but nobody has a recording of her. Nobody has uh, a written poem against Stalin. So even if they wanted to kill her, and she's so powerful that they would need a reason to kill her, they don't have the reason. And so that's why um, the secret police make sure that she is there every day. They're waiting to see if she would make a mistake and accidentally express her opinion of Stalin. So the two part answer is one, Stalin hopes that he can use her. And the other part is they don't have a very strong reason to kill her. Uh, and in fact, uh, we can see how careful Anna is not to leave evidence if we look at scene six on page six. Uh, we already know that Tosia is an informant. The secret police had gotten to her and they have asked her to uh, pay attention to what Anna says. So in scene six, Tosia pays a visit to Anna and Lily. And uh, if you read this entire conversation, you get the feeling that Tosia is there to try to observe, to find information or evidence. But the way that Akhmatova and Lily talk, you can feel that they disagree with everything, but they don't say it. They're sarcastic, they're mocking, but they don't give an actual opinion. This scene is written very carefully. Uh, if you try to look at what Anna and Lily are saying, you also will not find evidence, but you will be absolutely sure that they disagree with the government and with Tosia. Uh, I think we will have enough time in the next period to maybe reach scene six and we will be able to look at this scene in detail. OK, do you have questions or ideas about number four? OK, let's take a short break.
Okay, question five. Poetry must be useful and pay its way like everything else. Um, well, today, group four only has one member who is not actually in the room right now. Um, but I had the chance to talk with her during the break. And uh, her thinking on this question is that she agrees with part of it. So the idea that something has to pay its way means that it has to have some kind of contribution to society. It has to be connected with other things. It can't just exist alone. And the person in group four, your classmate, uh, disagrees in part because poetry can also be a personal thing. If we look on page 19, she pointed us to in the middle when Coors talks a long paragraph, line six. Most of your work was too personal. There's no personal life anymore. Uh, and group four believes that a personal poem is also valuable. It doesn't have to be entirely connected with anything else. On the other hand, she also agrees with part of this idea. Uh, because if a poem is too personal and others can't understand it, then it doesn't connect with anyone. And so even when it does have value, we can't see its value. It's the old question. When a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears a sound, uh, does it make a sound? And according to Coors, it doesn't. So uh, I think we can take group four's idea and we can generalize it, we can expand it. Poetry, like every kind of art, is part of society, but it is not entirely belonging to society. One way to look at art is um, it is the artist's perspective. It is how the artist sees the world or sees something in the world. And if this perspective belongs entirely to society, then there's nothing new. Right. This the artist is just repeating what other people's perspectives look like. So it has to be something new. It has to be something different. But if it's too different and too new, then there is no longer that connection to society or even people who appreciate art. And this is where things get tricky because art is about the artist's perspective but it is created by a person. A person who lives in society depends on social systems of logistics and agriculture and production and consumption. An artist is always part of society. So uh, from that angle, we can also say that an artist has some kind of duty to give back to society. Uh, now, the, the definition of giving back can be very different for each artist, but the one idea that connects every definition of giving back is that it has to be connected to society in some way. It could reflect society. It could critique society, criticize. It could have an associative relation with society. It can negate society, uh, which is to go opposite to uh, social values, but there has to be some kind of connection uh, to society. So this is simply a discussion of this quote. But if we look at where this is in the play. On page 19, remember Coors is a member of the secret police. He works for Stalin and as Group three pointed out Stalin sees writers as engineers of the human soul, and he wants writers to describe what we are doing. In other words, 
uh, if you look at Coors's long paragraph in the middle, he says, if your poetry isn't being published anymore, it's because it isn't useful. Comrade Stalin tells us life must be depicted as it should be, not as it is. And then the next line, we live in the present, but we look at it from our glorious future. So it seems like the kind of connection to society that Stalin wants is very specific. Stalin believes that writers should not describe life as it is, but as it should be. And when he says as it should be, he means according to his own ideas or according to communist ideas. And so that's why Kaur says we look at our present from our glorious future. This is um, an entire school of art and poetry called uh, socialist realism, which is a way for that artists use to sort of present and promote communist ideas. Uh, and it was a big movement in art precisely because the government only allowed this kind of art. Uh, and because artists are members of society, they also have to live and eat. They also have to make money somehow. So many artists uh, did their best to follow what Stalin wanted. But in this play, Anna doesn't. Right? We saw earlier that Anna still writes poetry. But instead of trying to publish it, she has her friends memorize the poetry. And it seems that for Anna, the point of poetry is not to be published or be famous. It seems that the point of poetry is the poem itself. That there might be some kind of connection between a poem and a reader. And that if a poem can make this connection with a reader, if it can change how the reader sees something or how the reader feels about something, that itself is the value of poetry. So the point isn't to create a book of poetry. The point is to spread the poetry to as many people as possible. So you don't need a book. And I'm talking about scene eight on page 11. Uh, here it says Akhmatova finishes writing. She tears it from her notebook and she gives the page to Lily and Lily memorizes the poem. And so she hands the paper back to Anna and on page 12, Anna asks her, are you sure? And Lily nods. And at the end of this scene, Anna strikes a match, Huo Cai, and burns that piece of paper. At this point, the paper is no longer the poem. The poem is the words in Lily's memory. OK, do you have questions or thoughts about uh, number five? Sam, did you think of anything else? Yeah, OK, cool. So. Uh, these are the discussion questions for this week. Do you want to ask or add some ideas about today's discussion? OK, before next week, please read up to the end of Act 1. So this is on page 35. OK, so we have a little time left. Let's take a closer look at the po at the uh, play. So remember that a published play is usually the 
um, record of its first performance. So it's the the play part is what the playwright has written, but it also gives us information about the premiere. Um, this is an important part of theater history. So it tells us that this play was first produced by the Melbourne Theatre Company uh, on 28 February 1998. And then it, it gives us the list of actors playing each role. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, some of these names are repeated because as we will see on the next page, each some actors play two roles. And after the actors, it gives us a list of the key crew members, the director. Um, in movies, the director is the most powerful person. But in theater, the most powerful person is the producer. The director is simply the person who uh, directs the actors uh, and like makes uh, like make sure people do things on time and according to schedule. But usually it's the producer who makes the decisions. Then we have the set designer. This is the person who designs the backgrounds of the stage. Costume designer. Composer. If there is music, uh, this person created it. Lighting designer. Um, if you go watch a play and it does use lighting effects, those are usually pre-programmed. Like there's a computer up top that you can program. Like if you press this button, those lights will come on. If you press that button, these lights will come on. Uh, because usually it's a lot of lights at the same time and one person cannot do everything. So the lighting designer designs the lighting program and uh, initiates the program during the performance. And then we have dramaturgy. This is something that you will not find in the crew of a movie. Dramaturgy is the art of transforming the words of a play into actions by the actors. So like when the play says Anna Akhmatova stands in the window, how does she do that? What position does she take? Does she move around? How long should it last? How should her face look? These concerns are what the dramaturge uh, takes care of. It, they translate written actions into actual performances. Some writers or directors or producers can do this, but it's actually its own kind of expert knowledge. Uh, so you will see that these two people are responsible for this job. OK. Uh, on the left characters. Uh, the ages aren't important for its themselves. The ages are important to give us a sense of um, how like where these characters are in the stage of life. So like when it says Rachel Sekharov is in her early 20s, that tells us that she is very inexperienced. She has she does not know a lot about life. She might be easily confused. Whereas when it says that Anna Akhmatova is 62. Uh, first of all, she is a historical person, so we know in 1951 exactly how old she was. Um, but the idea that she is in her 60s in a country that was that at that point, 1951, the USSR was born in 1917. And in 1951, it would be 34 years old. So Anna Akhmatova is almost twice as old as her country. So like when the secret police try to control her or tell her what to do, the idea that she is in her 60s tells us that she knows a lot more than these younger people. She has more experience. Uh, maybe she has some strategies to deal with these people. The same for these other ages, right? Late 20s, early 30s is in the middle of life. 40 is uh, usually we think of this as starting to get old with a bit more experience. 
so that's what the ages tell us. Sometimes a play will also give a brief description of what kind of person this is. Uh, here the author tells us that there's no meaning in the fact that one actor plays two roles. Uh, you can choose to believe her or not. And then you sometimes will have a bit of background uh, of the play. And so here the author tells us that Anna Akhmatova was a real person, but everybody else is invented. And it gives us a bit of background about what kind of person she is. And the most important part, I think, is when she traveled to Tashkent, this is in Central Asia, Tsongya, she was recognized for what some believe she truly was, a holy woman. So this tells us that she has a kind of spiritual power. And then the setting. Sometimes the setting will be very specific and there will be long descriptions. But here, the point of this play is about that kind of spiritual power. So the uh, appearance of the actors and the appearance of the setting are not that important. Each performance can decide how they want to make these places look. And last week we talked about the fact that it is a future. Um, there's no real reason why it's set in Australia. It's only because the author is from Australia. So it's kind of like a play written by a Taiwanese person is set in Taiwan. There's no real uh, importance to that. OK, and then the beginning of the play. Night and stars. So when you design the stage, you can think about how do you want to present the stars? Night is easy, right? It's dark. But what about the stars? How do you do that? Uh, and these two characters are walking. So this tells us in this scene, they are probably like going in circles or like back and forth on the stage. I'll tell you something Nadia used to do for Osip. So the first sentence gives us two people we don't know. Um, but by the time we reach the end of this paragraph, we realize we don't need to know these people. They're just part of a story. And the important thing is what the story says. Um, Nadia is a woman and Osip is a man. In many Western languages, if the name ends in A, it's usually a woman. And if it doesn't uh, end in A or I, if it ends with a consonant or ends with like a, a Y uh, that, or O, then it's usually a man. Uh, their room is even smaller than ours. So this tells us that Anna lives with Lily in a small room. And Osip needed privacy in order to write, so Osip is a writer. Uh, and we get this story of how uh, Nadia is very considerate of Osip. Whenever he needs to write, uh, she gives him the privacy that he needs. To give him the illusion of being alone. So in this story, uh, Osip cannot actually be alone. The most that Nadia can do for him is to give him the illusion of being alone. Already we get a sense of limitation and control in this society. And then we have the first line from Lily. I'm perfectly willing to sit out on the stairs, Anna. This line tells us the relationship between Lily and Anna. On, uh, just like Nadia and Osip, um, Lily is the companion and Anna is the writer. And so Lily says, if you need your privacy to write, I can go outside. Uh, but Anya, uh, Anna says, it wouldn't help. I waited last night and the muse didn't come. She didn't have inspiration. She, so, she comes so seldom now. And if she does, she sits in a corner and stares at me. What's the point of a silent muse? She wants an effort I can't make anymore. So here Anna is talking about 
how it seems harder and harder for her to write poetry. The muse no longer talks to her, no longer tells her what kind of poetry to write. And so Lily reassures her, yes, you can. You're doing the most important work there is. Uh, so we already get a glimpse of the main idea or the main theme of this play. That poetry and writing and art are the most important work there is. And by reading the rest of the play, we get a sense of why it is so important. Uh, then we get a new character. Stetsky appears in the background. Now think about this. At this point, he doesn't talk. Uh, when you're watching the play, all you see is some guy appearing on stage. But he doesn't talk. We don't know who he is. We only know that he's a strange man who probably is not a friend of Anna and Lily because he doesn't say hello. So immediately we don't trust him. Uh, and Anna and Lily continue the conversation. Stetsky lights a cigarette. This motion usually tells us that uh, he's he's trying to stay in place. He's not moving anywhere. He needs a reason to stay there, and so he lights a cigarette. Uh, what other country respects poetry as we do? People are killed for it. Yeah, that does make sense. If a country kills its poets, it must really care about poetry. Otherwise, like you could just let poets write whatever they want. Nobody would care. Only somewhere where poetry has a powerful effect would a government be so afraid of its poets that it would kill them. Uh, and so Akhmatova mentions two poets who were killed. Osip, the guy from the story. Uh, mentioning his name here is supposed to be a kind of shock. We only just learned his name. We only just learned a story about his life. And already, even before we meet him, he's dead. And then Anna mentions Kalia, another poet. And Lily uh, looks up. So like they don't want to keep talking about this. It's too depressing. And so Lily changes the subject. I find the night sky comforting. But uh, Anna says, no, not me, because there's no hope of rescue there. And so by talking about the sky and the stars, they give the audience the information that their great leader controls everything. Omnipotent means all powerful. Uh, so even though he doesn't own the stars, Anna says he owns our sight of them. So whether or not we can look at the stars is also up to their great leader. Uh, then Lily tells an, uh, her own story. There's a story going round about an actor. When the secret police arrested him, they asked his name and he said, my name was Boris Barshovsky. Notice he said, my name was Boris Barshovsky. They asked his address and he said, I lived on the Fontanka. They asked his occupation. He said, I was an actor. He put everything in the past tense. Why? Why would he do this? Uh, to me, it seems like he this this actor is protesting the power of the secret police. It's like once you have been caught by the secret police, you're just as good as dead. So it's no longer the present tense. It's the past tense. And that's where we get the twist at the end of the story. Out of sheer perversity, they let him go. Uh, perversity in Chinese, we call this bian tai or xing li bian tai. Uh, so, like, just to fuck with him, basically. 
they let him go. It's probably not true, but it's a good story. It is a good story. It tells you everything you need to know about the secret police. They control everything. They can kill you for very little reason, and they really like to fuck with people. So this is the kind of society that they live in. And Anna adds another twist to the story. They probably arrested him again the next day. Again, just to toy with him. So after giving us a picture of this society, uh, next we get Anna's own feelings about their situation. So you can say that the above uh, passages are for the audience. They are a kind of exposition. After giving the audience the necessary information, then we get the character's own feelings. Why does it take more and more horror to feel anything? So like the life uh, in this society is so terrible that things that we would think of as terrible for them are just normal. So it takes more and more horror to really feel anything. Uh, and then she mentions another person, Mayor Hold's wife. They took out her eyes. So they, uh, the secret police not only can kill you, they can also torture you. All I could think was, what did they do with them? So this society is so terrible that when something as bad as the police taking out a person's eyes happens, uh, Anna is no longer shocked. All she feels is a kind of curiosity. And so like this inability to feel terror or to feel shock, Anna says they want us to die while we're still alive. So like your body is still alive, but your spirit is dead. So scene one does the very important job of introducing the, the society that Anna lives in. Scene two, and uh, a warning siren sounds in short, threatening bursts. This is actually very important. Back in 1951, they didn't have sirens that can go for a short time. It was always a long siren uh, because sirens were created physically. They weren't digital sounds. They were physical sounds. Uh, if you've ever watched an old Hollywood movie, like the old ambulances, they go eh, for it lasts for a long time. So the fact that these are short, threatening bursts tells us that this is no longer in the past. Uh, and then we see somebody on stage. We at this point, we don't know that her name is Rachel, right? We only see a young woman. And a voice comes over a public address system, so it's coming from like the air or like the, the, the top of the stage or something. You don't see a person talking to Rachel. Uh, we talked about this part. A tracer. To trace something is to follow something or someone. So a tracer is it, lo it looks like a kind of object that could uh, follow a person or to pinpoint a person's location. So it's on chi. And when the voice asks what sector is your home, Rachel doesn't give a place name. She gives a number and a letter, which tells us that in this society, the government doesn't really care about your home. As long as you are alive and you can work for the government or whoever is in power, that's all they care about. So like, where is your home in Section 58B? And Rachel says this place looks like 58B. And this tells us that every sector looks basically the same. It's kind of like Singapore. Uh, and so after Rachel explains herself, the voice asks what her name is, 
And this is when we learn her name, Rachel Sekharov. Um, this is also a very good way to give information to the audience. Usually the person in control would know exactly who this person is and what's going on, but the play says that the tracer went random, so it broke. It's not working correctly. Therefore, Rachel has to explain herself. And by explaining herself, she explains her situation to the audience also. So the first question uh, the voice asks is, where do you belong, right? What sector? Only the second question is, what is your name? And the third question is not, what is your job? It is, do you have a job? So the, the person in control doesn't care what kind of job Rachel has. The important thing is that she has some kind of job. Later, we will discover that in this society, you have to be useful for society. And their definition of useful is to work, to have some kind of job. And Rachel's job is conference stress consultant. What does that mean? We don't know yet, um, but we will later discover that she is a sex worker. Her job is to meet with uh, people and help them relieve stress, usually with her body. Is this a test? This question tells us that in this society, the person in charge likes to test people to make sure that the people truly are following orders and truly do believe in the values of that society. And so Rachel thinks maybe this is a test to see how I react. So as group one mentioned in this society, even a personal reaction is controlled. But notice that the voice does not answer this question, right? The voice asks Rachel a lot of questions, but when Rachel asks the voice a question, the voice does not answer. And this tells us immediately who is in power and how much power they have. Uh, the voice gives Rachel a command, follow the yellow line to the nearest security center. This also gives us more information. Uh, they, the society does not let its people find their own way, right? They don't have to look at signs. They don't have to like uh, look at a map. All they have to do is follow a line that has been uh, provided by the person in charge. So Rachel doesn't have to think about it. She only has to follow orders. And where does the line lead her? Not home. It leads her to a security center. As I'm sure you all know, the word security simply means state violence. Uh, the, the power that the state has to force you to obey the law and follow the rules. It's a euphemism, wei wan ci. Uh, and so Rachel says, I want to go home. But the voice doesn't let her. It says security will verify if a tracer malfunctioned. So even though Rachel has given a reasonable explanation, the person in charge still doesn't believe her and they need to check that her story is true. So this tells us one more thing about this society. The government or the people in power trust nobody. Scene three, we're back in the past, an MGB interview room. Uh, now again, if you're simply watching the play, you don't know that this place is called the MGB. This stage direction is written for the reader, not for the audience. And for the reader, it's a joke. Because in the Soviet Union, the secret police was called the KGB. You would know this if you watch old 007 movies. Uh, but instead of calling them the KGB, it calls them the MGB. 
uh, because at the beginning of the play, the author says only Anna Akhmatova is a historical figure. Everyone else is invented. So I guess even the secret police are invented. Now again, for the audience, they don't know the names of these two secret, uh, the two secret policemen, Kors and Stetsky. They only see two men asking a woman questions. Uh, so like, look at these questions. Tell me about the people next door to you. And Tosia says, which people? I'm pretty sure Tosia knows who the police are asking about. Uh, this is her personal way of not cooperating, of showing that she does not entirely agree with the secret police. Even though at the end she still has to answer the questions, she doesn't have to answer the, co uh, the questions eagerly or like enthusiastically. Uh, so Kors has to tell her who he means. Anna Akhmatova and Lily Kalinovskaya. This is the first time we see these two characters' names, or the first time that we hear these two characters' names. We know from the first scene that they are called Anna and Lily, but this is the first time we get their full names. Tasia says, I don't know them. We just moved in, still trying not to cooperate with the police. Kors asks who visits them. She says, I don't know. When, how often are they from outside Leningrad? I don't know. Do they talk in whispers? This is interesting. So even if the secret police cannot hear what they say, if they can hear that Anna and Lily are trying to hide what they say, that could also be suspicious. Um, but here he's being sarcastic because he says they're in the room next to you and yet you don't know anything. What are they doing? Talking in whispers or something? Like what possible reason could you have for not hearing what they say? So this is uh, Kors' way of trying to get past Tosia's resistance. And this also tells us that Tosia has a husband. She says, I'm a teacher, I'm busy, I don't see anybody or listen. So up to I don't see anybody, this could be reasonable, right? When you're very busy, you don't pay a lot of attention. But here she says, I don't listen. There's a difference in English between the word hear and the word listen. The word hear means that you hear some kind of sound. But the word listen means to pay attention to those sounds. So when she says I don't listen, what she means is she hears people talking, but she tries very hard not to pay attention. Now, usually if you can hear your neighbor talking, you might feel a bit curious. What are they talking about? What kind of people are they? But here she tries very hard not to pay attention. And this is because she knows that if she hears something that is evidence against Anna Akhmatova and the secret police try to torture Tosia to find this information, she might be forced to condemn her neighbors. So in order to protect herself and to protect her neighbors, she tries very hard not to pay attention to whatever she hears. Uh, but then Kors keeps asking. He doesn't believe that she knows nothing. You share a kitchen with them, don't you? And a bathroom. So they share a kitchen and a bathroom. Uh, don't they eat? Don't they shit? What are they, ghosts? You must know something. Tasia says, I hardly know them. 
But Kors keeps asking. Lily Kalinovskaya was a colleague of yours. So like you work together, you must know something. But Tasia, Tasia says, in another department. So we didn't work together. Pay attention to this one. Your husband Yuri is a nuclear physicist. Difficult profession with so many prohibitions. So, so many rules. You can't do this, you can't do that. Does he remember all of them? Do you think? What does course mean? Why does he say this? It's a threat. He's saying that I can find some excuse to lock up your husband if you don't cooperate. This is actually a key way that a totalitarian society controls its people. It creates so many laws and so many rules. Some of them even are contradictory. You can't follow all the rules all the time so that the government always has an excuse to arrest you if they want to. So uh, the citizens are always afraid of the government and they always want to make sure they do they follow orders. So he threatens her husband and then he asks the question that he cares about. Why was Lily Kalinovskaya dismissed? Why was she fired from her job? And Tasia finally gives uh, um, a serious answer. A student denounced her. Uh, to denounce means to like uh, to give evidence to the state against the person. Uh, but Kors wants to know the details. For what? What did the students say that Lily did? Tasha says, you know the answers. It's true. He's the secret police. He knows the answers. But he says, I want to hear your answers. So the point of this questioning is not to find out about Lily. It's to find out whether Tasia is obedient, whether Tasia is a good citizen and follows the law. And so uh, because Tasia uh, knows that the secret police have the answer, so she gives a truthful answer. Lily was fired for using a copy of Comrade Stalin's short course to prop open a window. When you see a name of something in italics, 写体字, this is the title of a kind of work. Could be a book, could be a movie. It's a kind of work, 一种作品. Uh, and here it refers to a book. Stalin wrote a book called Short Course on Socialism or Communism or something. Uh, it's kind of like his version of Mao's Little Red Book. This is Mao Zedong's book, Kind of like that. It's his. It's the collection of Stalin's thinking. And so, good citizens would always respect that book uh, as a kind of respect for Stalin. But Lily used that book to prop open a window. So the idea is that the, you would uh, the window would not stay open. So she put a book under the window to keep the window open. Like a, a window that opens up and down. So it, it keeps falling. So to keep open the window, Lily put a book uh, to keep the window open. This means that Lily was using the book for a purpose that is not like learning or reading the ideas of Stalin. And so it's disrespectful. It's like um, if you use a Bible to keep a door open. Very disrespectful. And it's the correct answer. So Kor says thank you. Now at this point, Tasia tries to uh, win some sympathy for Lily. You know what a hot summer it's been. So like it's reasonable that Lily wanted to keep open that window. You shouldn't uh, blame her too much. But Kors doesn't care about Lily. He cares about Tasia. So he keeps asking questions. 
why is Lily living with Anna Akhmatova? At this point, Tasia has already given a truthful answer before, so she feels like she might as well keep giving truthful answers. She already gave in once. What's the difference in giving in again? So she gives a truthful answer. Her landlord threw her out when she lost her job. Akhmatova took her in. This sentence tells us something also. Remember in scene two, the voice asks Rachel, do you have a job? So having a job is very important. Here, Lily's landlord kicked her out because she didn't have a job. So in communist Russia, having a job is also very important. And only someone like Anna, who disagrees with communism, would be willing to give Lily a new home. Uh, by the way, in the United States, having a job is also very important. They don't have a national health insurance plan. In the US, if you want health insurance, you need to have a job. Your boss will give you health insurance. OK, so Korz's next question. What is Lily doing for Anna? Is she helping her in any way? Uh, Tazia says she's doing the shopping and the cooking. She says Akhmatova doesn't eat unless someone reminds her. Huh. On the last page, Tosia says, I don't know anything, I don't listen. But here, she is able to tell Kors what Lily said about Anna. So that tells us she did hear something. She does have uh, conversations with them. Uh, Kors, what is Lily living on? So like, where does she get her money? Tosia says, I don't know. I think she's looking for another job. Kor says, did you see any papers in the room? This question is unexpected to Tasia, so she repeats the question. Papers? Note paper, manuscripts, so called, poems. So this is what Kors really wants to know about Anna. Is she still writing poems? Tasia's answer is, I haven't seen the room. We don't know whether this is true. It could be true. She could also be lying again because once she knows what Kors wants, she can therefore decide whether to give that information to him. And she decides not to give that information. The scene ends here on this note of ambiguity. She could be telling the truth, she could be lying. And that actually is the feeling of living in this society. When you can't trust anybody, then when someone talks to you, you have to be able to imagine that they are either telling the truth or they are lying. You have to be able to prepare for both at the same time. OK, let's stop here. Uh, do you guys have questions about the first three scenes? Okay, so again, before next week, please finish Act 1. So to the end of page 35.